Good morning. I am Reverend Laura Murphy, and I am with the Missouri United Methodist Foundation. And while I am an elder in the Missouri Conference, and I have served both large and small churches, I now serve through the foundation. I do a variety of things as their director of development, but probably some of my favorite things to do one is I like to call myself the generator of generosity. And I help churches generate generosity in a variety of ways. But I also get to do some very practical things like fill in for a pastor that's on vacation. And I am thrilled that I can be here today to give Sean a break while he is on vacation. Um, Sean and I have a connection because he and I um, go back in ministry together when I was the pastor at Gashland United Methodist Church and he was here at North Cross. That's when we started doing Holy Week services together. And uh, I left then and went on to a, another church, have moved back to North Kansas City. And every now and then I'm here at North Cross as well. So it is a joy to be here with you this morning. And I'm going to return in about a week and a half and do a workshop called Putting Your House in Order. And those that are in person are going to receive brochures about that. There's going to be those at the church. Um, but also watch your newsletters. You're going to learn a lot about um, some legacy planning. And I will let you read up on that kind of thing. But legacy is one of my things that I like, really enjoy working with people on. Um, to be able to discern their legacy of what they want to leave behind. And yes, sometimes that's financial or possessions that they have. But I really believe our greatest legacy is our story. And I think it's our story that is important that all of us tell it. And we think, you know, I at least believe we want our story told well. And so my question for you today is, do you think you could write your own story? Now, this can sound very daunting to many people, but people's stories are my favorite part of being a pastor. I get invited into the, and witness those little life moments in people's stories. Life moments can be things like the birth of babies. It can be weddings or job changes. It can be transitions in life, like graduation, or sometimes through divorce or something new that's happening. And occasionally it's also through a diagnosis or death. But as I walk the journey with people through their life moments, if we look really close, we also see there are God moments. God moments that change everything in that person's life. But have you ever noticed, when we are living and putting our stories of our life together, it's just all a blur. It is happening so fast that we don't realize we have a story that can be written, a story that needs to be shared over and over, a story that is being watched by others. It's a story that is evolving into a legacy of what we will leave behind a legacy of how we will be remembered. So today, I have a little challenge for you. Instead of leaving your story writing to someone else after you're gone, I challenge you to start thinking of how you would like to have your story told. Now, before you get um, into the idea of thinking you have to write a great big long memoir, I wanna take this just a little bit further. Instead of thinking of a long memoir, I would like to challenge you to possibly think, could you write your story in just six words? Now, this idea of writing your story in just six words, I found it in a book, a book that was published in about 2009. The book was called Not Quite What I Was Planning, Six Word Memoirs from Writers Famous and Obscure. Now, the authors of this book, they challenge people all across the nation to write their story in just six words. Well, when this book came out, it sparked a battle of brevity amongst many people. For example, teachers started looking at it, and they started thinking, hmm, I think I'm going to assign six-word memoirs to our students. Imagine how excited, like a high school senior is, going, oh, I don't have to write a whole long term paper. I could just write six words. But soon students learned that they were faced with the reality of the amount of thought 
and reflection it really takes to be able to boil their story down just into something, a brevity. But this kind of thing also sparked conversations, conversations around dinner tables. For example, can you sum up your day in six words? Or when you have family around the table at Thanksgiving time, sum up what you're grateful for in six words. At Christmas time, can you sum up what you have been through in the past year in six words? Or at New Year's, can you tell your New Year's resolution in six words? Suddenly, people were having conversations everywhere using their five fingers and usually a thumb to count to make sure there was legitimacy of their six words. And I'm sure it also sparked a few debates over the validity of hyphenated words. Because you know words like eye-opening, twofold, long-term, those words can pack a lot of power in a six-word memoir. But as people were telling their stories of their six-word memoirs, some were near the end of their life. They were near the end of their life, and they knew what they were writing was going to sum up everything that they've experienced, trying to sum up what they've learned and what they want to pass on to someone else. However, the majority of those who wrote their six-word memoirs for those books and since then, they really were standing in a different spot. They were standing in a spot in a moment in time where they could choose what they wrote, looking at the past, but also looking at the future. Their six-word memoir and what they came up might have changed the trajectory of where they were headed. Now, maybe to kind of help you get your head around this idea of a six-word memoir, and maybe even to think it's possible, let me share with you some of these short stories that came out of that book of six-word memoirs. I have a few for you here that I'm going to show you. The first one is kind of fun. The psychic said I'd be richer. You know, it's kind of fun. You might think about that one. But here in the next one, very different. This one is cursed with cancer, blessed with friends. We might think that that was written by a person maybe in their 80s or an older adult. But actually, the author of that one was a young child. Here they had the insight to see that even though they were cursed with cancer, their life story is that they are also blessed with friends. There's always a story deep within those six-word memoirs. And so this next one, I've kind of wondered what the story might be there. They wrote, not a good Christian, but trying. And then the other one, I wonder what the story might be around this one. Thought I'd have more impact. Maybe we can kind of feel that way. Maybe that's something we can relate to. But the next one, there has to be a story that's just amazing. It says, I still make coffee for two. Hmm, wonder what the story is there. But my next one is kind of fun. This person wrote, extremely responsible, secretly longing for spontaneity. That is kind of maybe we all are in that little bit of a spot. The next one is one of my friend's absolute favorite. She says, I'm my mother, and I'm fine. You might get an amen um, or two out of that one here. The last one I'm going to share, though, it's really interesting. It says, 14 years old, story, just beginning. You know, really, I think we could take any age. Think of what your age is. Put it into this one, whatever that age is. Story, just beginning. Now, this book on six-word memoirs, it didn't just catch my eye. It um, also caught the eye of Christian author John Ortberg. Some of you might be familiar with John Ortberg and some of his work, but he stretched this idea just a little further. For him, it became a quest of what would it look like if he took biblical characters and told their stories in six words. Let me show you a little bit of what he came up with. And I love this because, you know, it's probably the shortest version of the Bible you're ever going to hear. But the first one here is Abraham. His story is summed up with left Ur, had baby, still laughing. You might be more familiar with Noah. Noah's story he summed up as hated the rain, loved the rainbow. 
The next one's a little more complicated. It's Mary's story. Hers is manger, pain, joy, cross, pain, joy. They did a lot of punctuation in that one. It tells Mary's story. He also does what I call the Dr. Seuss version of the prodigal son. Let me share this one. It is bad, sad, dad, glad, brother, mad. He also has the woman caught in adultery. Her story he summed up as picked up man, put down stones. But what I really like about these is John Ortberg even tackled the life of Paul. Much of our New Testament is filled with Paul. So he filled his with Damascus, blind, suffer, right, change world. There's a lot to sum up in just six words for Paul's life. But did you see anything interesting about some of these stories? Maybe what they had in common? I think these stories... I think all of them and most of them in the Bible, they all revolve around a story of that person's life and how it intersects with God's story. Each of these characters would not have been able to predict where their lives would have taken them. But their lives were interrupted. They were interrupted by God and often for many of them drawn into the path of Jesus. All of them recovered from something difficult. All of those stories are stories about new life. And interestingly enough, each of these stories, each of their lives become a legacy because they're still impacting us today. Think about that. These are average everyday people like us, never having a clue that for decades, thousands of years, their story would still be told, but they're rich with legacy. And we can learn something from all their stories. We're still talking about them today. And there's a lot to learn. After all, a legacy is a gift that is handed down. It's something conveyed from one person to another. Often we think a legacy has to be about something physical that we pass down. But really, legacy is more about sharing what we have learned, not just what we've earned. And it's all about bequeathing values over valuables. A legacy, really the material wealth that we leave behind, is really only a very small portion. It's just a fraction of our legacy. It's our story that is so rich. So knowing this, do you see how people's stories become their legacy? And that's why I want you to look at your own story And I hope that you can figure out how your story can be told and how it can impact your legacy. But before you go further, before you dive in and start thinking of what your story might be and how you want to write it, why don't we practice a story? Practice a story maybe that comes out of the Bible and see if we could put a six-word memoir together for them. I thought that might be useful, so let's look at Zacchaeus' story. It's a story that um, we all know well, you know, that little song, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Well, let's go to his story in the Bible. As I read this, listen closely. Maybe jot down a word or two or three or four or five or six that you think we could string together to put together the six-word memoir of Zacchaeus. Coming out of Luke 19, 1 through 10, Um, In the NIV version that I'm using, it says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a a sycamore fig tree to see Jesus. Since Jesus was coming that way, but when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said, you guys all know the line, Zacchaeus, you come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and he welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and they began to mutter, Jesus has gone to be the guest of a sinner? But Zacchaeus stood up 
And he said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anyone out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of God, excuse me, for the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Now, as you heard that scripture, or were there words that kind of rustled around in your head, either ones that were used or ones that maybe were descriptive of Zacchaeus? So for us to kind of get this idea of a six-word memoir of Zacchaeus, it might be good for us to look at not just who he was, but also what he did. Because it's easy to remember that Zacchaeus is a tax collector. But it also said in that scripture that he is a chief tax collector. Now, not only does this put him at the top of what I call the food chain of tax collectors, but it also makes him richer, one of the richest tax collectors out there. But it also is descriptive of his heart. It's descriptive in helping us think that he is really probably a dark-hearted sinner. He's the worst of the worst. And it also says, though, in there, not only is he a tax collector, but that he wants to see Jesus. What do you think possesses a dark-hearted sinner to want to see Jesus? I wonder if Zacchaeus had been listening to people in the crowds, if he had heard a testimony or somebody share with him what Jesus had done for them. Maybe that's why he wanted to see Jesus. Or maybe, maybe he wanted to see Jesus because he had doubts. How many of us have said, if I could just see it with my own eyes, I would believe it. Maybe that's where Zacchaeus was coming from. <laughs> or maybe, maybe he was just in awe of Jesus. Kind of like how we treat a rock star. Oh, I just want to get a glimpse. I want to see that person. Whatever it was, Zacchaeus was intentional about, about not turning his back on Jesus. But instead, he turned toward Jesus. Another thing that we can pick up from the scripture as we look for things to describe him is we all know he was short. And we always go in our minds to the idea that he was short in physical stature and he very well could have been. But as Luke tells the story, I can't help but think Zacchaeus is also short in moral stature. Perhaps that's why he ran ahead. Maybe it was to get height to see in the tree, but maybe it was also it was to get away, get away from all those people that were harassing him for being that dark-hearted tax collector that he was. Whatever it is, he gets himself up in that tree, and that's where he has his encounter with Jesus. But the interesting thing is that encounter goes an entirely different way that I think Zacchaeus was probably planned. It was an encounter that put Jesus right at Zacchaeus' house. Have you ever had that kind of experience? Where you've asked Jesus to do something in your life and it went much different than the direction that you had planned? Whatever it was for Zacchaeus, by the end, by the end of that story, it doesn't tell us if simply seeing Jesus is what gave him that idea to be generous or if it was because he got to know Jesus in his home, in a very personal way in his own life, that maybe there it turned him toward being generous. We don't know if it was an immediate conversion or something that he fought for quite a while until he finally gave in and opened himself up to, something many of us can relate to. The story moves so quickly that we don't know if it did happen all at once or in a compact, dense, you know, short period of time. But we do know that in his multiple encounters with Jesus, it suddenly turns important to Zacchaeus that he be generous. What's important to the story is that Zacchaeus was seen. Zacchaeus changed, and his response is he's generous. So John Ortberg, 
did kind of come up with an idea of a six-word memoir for Zacchaeus. Now that I've shared some of these words, let me share with you what John Ortberg did when he summarized him in six words. He wrote, Zacchaeus climbed sycamore tree, short, poorer, happier. Some of you might be satisfied with that, thinking that's a really good six-word memoir. For me, I thought there was more to it than just climbing a tree and being short and poor. I do believe that there was more. So I came up with this. Sinner, climb tree, remembered as generous. Maybe you like this one better. I came up with this as well. Welcome Jesus to his home, changed forever. But this last one is simple and short. It says, wanted to see, eyes are open. But I want you to focus on those words for a minute. Because I want to point out a couple of things. Wanted to see, eyes are open. That's really two sentences. And get that in the two sentences, you know, out of six words, we have that punctuation. And there's something that I think is happening when we are using the punctuation in some of these stories when we are also talking about how God intersects with our lives. I believe that that period means by the grace of God. Wanted to see, by the grace of God, eyes were opened. Now we all need to remember that the key to Zacchaeus' story is that he did intersect with God's story. Jesus came into Zacchaeus' life. He called him to come to him, to love him unconditionally, or Jesus loved him unconditionally, and Jesus offers him salvation. And once again, Jesus does the unexpected and change the life of that person, change the path that they were on. There is something that is a promise here for all of us. I believe that promise is that anyone who desires to see Jesus will, and their life will be changed. But this story, this idea that our lives are changed when we get to know Jesus, it doesn't just happen in the Bible. It happens every day in the world around us. It happens in our own lives. It happens when the story of our life intersects with God's story. Even if it's brief, there's something in that brevity that our story is sharply told and it drops like a golden nugget into the next generation as part of our legacy. Now, several years ago, I did an activity very similar to this with a group of folks that were in one of my churches. We were talking about what happens when God, or when God intersects our lives, when it happens, when that comes together. And could we tell it briefly? I thought it might be fun to kind of share with you a few things that, come, um, that some of these folks came up with. My first one is my own story. I can sum it up like this. Diagnosed dyslexic, read scripture to thousands. I was diagnosed dyslexic in the third grade. Back in the 70s, nobody really even knew what dyslexia was, but my mom had heard about it, realized I was struggling in school, finally got a teacher to listen to her, and um, I got to the school psychologist. He was like, wow, I read about this, I've never seen a child deal with this, and um, he found it fascinating, but they really didn't know what to do to help me. I um, was though well loved on and cared for and encouraged, and I made it through elementary, junior, and high, junior high school and high school. And uh, but when I got to high school, and I'm doing okay, I wanted to go to college, and I really wanted to go to Michigan State University. It was 30 minutes from my home. It's where my brother had gone, and I took my ACT test. And this is back in the 80s. You didn't study for the ACT test or get tutored or anything, and usually took it once. And I got an 11 on my ACT, which is super low. So I received the letter from Michigan State saying I would not be accepted. Well, long story short, I ended up finding out who the admissions officer was at Michigan State. I found out where their office was, and I paid him a visit. And after a conversation with him, he said, you're the kind of person we want here at Michigan State. That's how I got into college. However, you know, that was a turning point for me in my life. 
And um, I've gone on to not only get a college degree, I now stand before you with a master's degree. But sometimes I think about that little girl that was struggled to read. And I was diagnosed dyslexic, period, by the grace of God. I now stand before people and I read scripture. I have read scripture to thousands, and I do believe it's by the grace of God. But there are other stories I can share with you too. One is from an older lady who says there's been so many struggles in her life, but so many good things. So she tied her life together with rocky path smoothed out by faith. But before I show you the next one, I want to tell you a little bit about this person. The next one came from a young man that was in this group that we were doing this together. And he was in high school, and he grew up in a difficult home and had never had much of a faith life. Another youth in the church invited him to go on a mission trip with them. And this young man says that's where he found Jesus, and Jesus found him. And uh, I had the opportunity to watch his faith grow while he uh, journeyed through high school. And so he summed up his life at this point like this. Alone and unknown, accepted and connected. And there we go. There's a little bit of grace of God thrown in all of that as well. And the next one, though, is selfish, alcoholic. Sober, hopeful, helping others. Look at the amount of punctuation in that one. There's a whole lot of grace of God in that one. But that came from a very brave man in our community, very actively involved in our community and our church. And the first time he shared that story, his story, was in our group. And now he shares it often, and he truly is helping others. I'll kind of share the last one on kind of a fun note. This guy says life was full of ups and downs. It was like riding a roller coaster. So he said his six words are wild ride, screaming, laughing, hands up. You know how you go and you be adventurous. And I think that captivates him very, very well. But now, as I've shared all these with you, now I'm going to lay it back to you. I want you to think about your own faith story. Mix it with the challenge of a six-word limitation and write your own story. Now, a lot of times I do this in churches, and people will, by the time I'm out the door, say, hey, I got my six-word story, and I love to collect those. So I'm going to real quick just show you three of them, um, three of them that are pretty good that uh, people have given me. One came from a guy in the band as I was leaving the church. He goes, oh, my six words is strumming for Jesus never gets old. Usually the band amens me on that one. One came from a great woman. She said, my sense of humor saved me. Awesome. And then this last one, I don't know, I'm not going over, well, it's up here. It's born to leap, afraid, excuse me, born to lead, afraid to leap. This one came from a church that I was at where a young man sat in the sound booth. I shared the sermon, and um, afterwards he wanted to talk to me. And he says, I'm really struggling to figure out my six words. And he says, um, I think this is what it is. I am really born to lead. I'm afraid to leap. About six or eight months later, I was back in his church. And when I went back, um, he saw me, and he came over, and he quickly told me, he goes, remember my six words? I said, well, actually, I do. And he says, it's changing me. He goes, I'm not as afraid to leap. I'm starting to lead. His was written with the idea that it could change his future. Now, I hope, I hope that all of you will write your own story. But when you write it, I hope you write it not necessarily thinking these six words will close the book of your life story. But instead, I want you to write a story that will open up the richness of your legacy that is still to be lived out. A story where God intersects your life and opens your heart up to totally something new. Opens your heart up to something that is life-giving something that is generous, something with meaning that comes from serving a cause greater than your own, something that honors your creator and will outlive your time here on earth. My prayer is that your story will be one that is heard in heaven. And when it is heard, God will say, 
well done, good and faithful servant. And all the people here will say, Amen.